our friend Bernadette, Dr. Bernadette Rapps, well known for many people here. Uh, Bernadette's going to give us a talk on visualising and contextualising the rock art sites of Trump of conservation through education. And Bernadette, and I'm going to restrict myself to what I know here, there are other things that I could say, having taught uh, as a classic student. Bernadette has an academic background in ancient history, in classical languages, and natural history illustration, and has volunteered on archaeological digs in Jordan, which led to a PhD for the ancient wall paintings from Palela Gasol in Jordan. She currently teaches the theoretical component of the natural history illustration and has developed course curriculum in this area. Thank you, Bernadette. Firstly, thank you for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, as you heard Bernie say, um, we're, we're old friends, and uh, I sort of had a, a passion for cultural heritage of any sort. Um, I think growing up in this area, that included um, you know, the cultural well, heritage. I apologise to you, I can't hear. I'm interested. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Do you want me to stand in front of the microphone? Yes, please. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'll stand over here. Um, I have an interest in all cultural heritage, um, which is why I work in Jordan. Um, I work on a, on a site in Jordan with archaeologists, but I'm not an archaeologist. Um, I'm an ancient historian. So when I work on that site, I, I do the illustrations. And one of the things that inspired me to, um, to go into the area that I'm going to talk about today is when I was in Jordan a while back, I, I went down to speak at the local school because I... I love children and I, I just thought I'll take some gifts over from Australia for the local school in the area where I was working. And when I went down to the school, I, I said to them, I'm working up the hill on the archaeological site and I started to talk about things from the early Bronze Age and the Calcolithic period and they just looked at me blankly. And I said to them, don't, don't you know what's up the hill? And they said, no. And I said, isn't that taught in the school? And they said, no, we don't teach anything that's pre -Islamic. Oh. And I was horrified at that, and that made me realise why there was so much vandalism on that side, was because they had lost that connection with the earlier part of their history. And it was that moment that I realised that the same thing is happening in Australia, is we've lost that connection with the earlier part of our history. And that's what's inspired me to sort of build this project that I'm going to talk about today. Um, as Bernie mentioned, I have had a bit of an interesting sort of academic um, career, and I'm now teaching in natural history and illustration. And, um, but I have to come at, come at this from a different sort of um, angle. You know, I still have a passion for ancient history as well as illustrating that. So this is the sort of thing that I'm going to be talking about today is um, I've developed a new project and this has come about from lots of years of discussion with, with me and um, with other people who have shared this passion that we have for this local area and we want people to respect the heritage of this area. And I sort of thought, what can I do? I mean, and this is something that's sort of come out in this conversation today, which I'm so excited about, is that we can all do something. And I sort of thought at the time, I, I can't do anything. I'm not Indigenous, this is not my story. It's not my right to be working on this sort of heritage. And I thought that I was limited in what I could do. And it was, it was at a point that I realised, okay, I can do something with the skills that I have because I'm a contextualist, that's what my research is. I find things and I put them into context, which is what my PhD project was about. And I'm also an illustrator. And I thought, what can, can I use the skills that I have to help promote the heritage of this area? So I've designed a project that will contextualise the rock art. And, and the, that, the, these rock art sites, it's not just about the rock. It's about the landscape that's around the rock that's important. It's about the stories that were told when people went to the rock that it's important. Now, the rock itself is important. That's not the only thing that we should be protecting and sharing. Um, so I've, I've designed a project, and we're going to start, and I must say this, um, Mary and I have been talking about this for, for years and years and years. And then last year, I was I had a phone call on a Friday afternoon and said, Bernie, you need to, you need to get together a project, can I, I need it by Monday. Um, thank you, Andrew, my colleague Andrew, that gave me that phone call. Get something together by Monday, I want you to do something on the culture of this area that we can do with our students. So fortunately, we had already been discussing this for years, that we want to actually go out and record all of the rock art sites for this area. 
Um, it is an amazing area of cultural heritage. Um, yeah, it is an amazing area of white people's heritage. It's an amazing area for indigenous heritage. And you know, there's over 3,000 identifier sites in this area, and we're not getting funding. As Julian just said, the funding is not going to this area, and we need to address that. Why are these sites not known? Everyone knows about the sites in Padura and Kakadu and Arnway, all of those northern sites. People know about them. If you go down the street of Newcastle and you ask somebody about the rock art sites of this area, they'll just look at you and say, what, what rock art sites? You know, there might be one or two out of the hundred people that you talk to that actually know about these sites. So my goal of this project was to get that information out there, not by having people come and visit the sites themselves, but by actually getting that information to the people and sharing this knowledge. So the, the main problem with the rock art sites, as I see it today, is that they're, they're under threat. You know, we, we've heard today that about um, the vandalism, they're under threat by an unintentional threat as well by people who are, you know, are, are realise that they're damaging the rock art sites by touching them or different things like that. Also by um, industrial development near you know, the mines that's sort of been built around them. So they, they are definitely under threat. Um, and there's people like Professor Portashon that we've just heard who have been passionate about this for years. Um, and we want to sort of build on that um, passion. And he has said that if we don't do something now, these sites will be gone like they've been probably 10 years for some of them or 50 years for most of them. It's urgent that we actually stop talking about this and start doing something about it. Yeah, you know, I don't want to be in a meeting in 40 years' time, like we said, still talking about this. I want to be in a meeting in 40 years' time and say, thank goodness we acted when we did, because now we can actually have something to show. Um, you know, you, these sites used to be maintained. It was part of the, um, the indigenous heritage. They you know, go and retell these stories and they maintain the, the engravings um, when they're there. And, and that's also sort of being lost from um, part of the, the preservation side of things, is that's not actually happening. happening. I, I go up to this side of Black Rock and officially look out on a fairly regular basis, but I love it. I, I, I really think it's a beautiful site. I went up there last week. And I could hardly see. You passed 50 getting there. What was that, sir? You passed 50 getting there. Yeah, the day passed the Finchley tree going down onto the flat rock. And I went up there and I could hardly see the engravings. And I was there two years ago and I could see them clearly. So just in that short period of time, that, that's, that lost a lot of their visibility. And I think that's also, you know, what I want to express is this is urgent that we record this now while we can still see them. The, I think one of the main problems is there is this lack of respect for our culture. And you know, we've touched on this today. People have commented on this. Why don't we have this respect for our culture that they that do in Indonesia or that you know they do in other places? And I think that you know, we can put up guards, we can do all of these sort of things to protect these guys, not take people there. But I think the main problem that is causing this damage is that loss of connection. Um, and this is something, I was, I was down at a friend's place in um, Colmo Heights a little while ago, and he had a rock outside on the border of his property that bordered onto national parks. And he took it down there, and the rock art was actually okay, but in the habitation cave next to it, all the local kids had made their cubby house. And you know, there was stuff everywhere. And I said, oh, hey, who is doing this? And he said, he knows exactly who's doing it, it's the policeman's kids, but you know, he's not going to talk to the policeman um, about his kids. But it's just that they hadn't been educated as children to respect these sites. And that's where the main goal of this project that I'm sort of getting up and running is to come in. We want to educate people so that they will feel that connection. And it wouldn't even cross their mind to damage the sites once they feel that connection. Now, sometimes we think that limiting access to these sites is, is the way of protecting them. Um, I think that, to a certain extent, that is true. I think, but there's also a risk of that in that, you know, if we lose that connection of the site, if we don't actually, you know, get to go to these places anymore, or they're not shared in some other way, if, we, if people do stumble across them, and these sites that are up in the Yango National Park, there's lots of people up in that area. You know, there's lots of campers, there's lots of bushwalkers, hikers, mountain bike riders, mountain bike riders. There's people in there. What we have to make sure <coughs> is if they do stumble across these sites, it wouldn't even cross their mind to damage them. 
you know, they will look at them, they'll respect them, and they'll move on to somewhere else. We can't, you know, just prevention is not always the cure. You know, we have to actually address that, um, you know, that loss of connection. So whose responsibility is it to do this? Um, you know, up until now, the main responsibility has laid on the shoulders of government organisations, so national parks, Office of Environment Heritage, local councils. Um, sometimes the NGOs, like non-government organisations, have sort of come in and helped to conserve this in a, um, collaboration with Aboriginal advisory groups. Um, I think it's a local job. I think it's our job um, to connect these things. Um, as we've sort of saying, this area has been so overlooked. I think it's up to Newcastle University in collaboration with others to actually get this research happening. Um, and I'm passionate about that. I want to see that happen and I want to work with all of these other bodies to see that happen. Um, you know, there has been some people sort of coming in from afar to sort of um, do some of the sites in the Wollongong My National Park, but uh, the publications of those sites aren't reaching the general public. The publication of those sites is only reaching the academic community and those specifically with an interest in rock art. The general public still don't know about these sites. Um, and, and I think they need to. So um, the, part, the project that I'm setting up is that I've just labelled it the Rock Up Project for now. It will have some fancy name at some point, but it's just started. Um, we're going to involve the undergraduate students in this project. I think we have a huge body of people here that we could use that we're not using to help us to do this. Um, and the, we'll be used, doing it with, um, in collaboration with other researchers and Aboriginal advisors and we will be going out to record these sites, um, monitor them, um, the, the preservation of the sites and to share them with the general public. And this is a project that we've set up with um, Wolatuka. I've been going over and meeting with Wolatuka and I really want them to be involved with it. It's not just natural history illustration, we want this to be a joint collaborative project and I've also sort of spoken to the um, the Fall River Working Party about this before. We want to do this with others who are also passionate about it. So one of, one of the inspirations for this project came from a presentation that was um, organised a uh, year or so ago. It was given downstairs in this very building by um, Professor Catherine Ford from Bucknell University. Um, some of you might have been at that um, lecture that she gave. And I was sitting there listening to that lecture thinking, this is what we need. This is what we need to do in this area. And it sort of inspired me to actually keep on, not give up on, on this project. Um, so their, their project was um, creating an interactive cultural map of the river of the Susquehanna. Uh, so what they did is they went out, and again, it was a uh, cross-disciplinary undergraduate project from Buckingham University. So they got students from all different areas of that university to work on this project to get together an interactive map of this region that has a very strong cultural heritage. Um, what I want to do is a very similar project, is I want to go out and record these sites, not reveal their location, I don't want people to actually go out there unless they're already open to the public, but I want people to actually be able to click on the button or go to a museum display and learn about this area. So this is the, the course that we've, we will run. Um, the first um, time we will be operating will be this year in June. And it's called a, a cross-disciplinary uh, compressed course. And we want students from all different areas of the university to come in and help contextualise these sites. So we actually want to look at them as rather than just a painted rock surface. We want to look at them in the whole big picture of what that rock surface was in relation to the one around the corner and what that one was in relation to the whole mountain range. And we want to put it into context so these things have more meaning. So, you know, we've invited students from communication to come along and help to talk, tell the story. Um, you know, students from you know, geology and ecology and all of these sort of um, areas of the university that can come and actually work on this project with us. So how will we do this? Obviously, there are a lot of limitations on working on rock art sites, and we have to you know, do things properly. Um, so we will be following the guidelines that's established by the government on how to work on these sites. So you know, obviously, we're not going to physically touch the rock art site. We're going to go out there and record it without actually doing any scientific analysis. Any of those sort of things, we'll leave that to the archaeologists. That's not our field. That's, I'm not interested in the dating. We'll leave that to the specialists who actually have that field. What we're interested in doing is recording and visualising and sharing these um, rock art sites. 
So obviously we're going to go through all of the guidelines that's established to um, do this style of recording. And we have specialists who have agreed to come on board and be part of this project. So they will also bring their, their knowledge and their, um, their technology to help us to visualise these things and to record them in the most modern and accurate way. So we'll be using things like um, Dstretch, which is a program designed by NASA and is used by um, rock art scientists to actually see the images in um, ways that you can't actually see with the, um, this natural way when you go out there. So by taking photographs and then enhancing them with this software, we can actually see what we're missing. Um, so we'll be using this sort of technology. We'll be using a thing called RTI, which actually when you're talking about engraved surfaces, this sort of um, software is perfect for looking at that. You can actually see the depth of the engraving by just using this um, software package. So we'll be using things like this. Um, one of the um, very fortunate sort of um, coincidences of this project was I was talking about it when I was over at a difficult conference in Vienna a fortnight ago. And just one of the people that was at the table said, oh, yeah, I know someone who does all that. He's in Sydney. You know, give him a call. And, and I did, and he was just so keen to come along and be part of the project and to teach our students how to do this sort of stuff. Um, so we'll also be using things, if it's a limited um, light um, in the area where we'll, we'll be working, we'll be using things like the UV um, v light in the camera and uh, infrared lighting, which makes it easier to see the pigments and the, um, the rock engravings. Um, but again, you can't see with your, um, your eye. Um, we'll be doing the photogrammetry of the site. All of this is not intrusive. You can just go to the edge of the site and do all of this without touching, without damaging it in any way. But this will give us a, a 3D um, capture of the site that is interactive. So if we put this up on the website or we use it in the mu museum display when we finish, people can actually move it around and they can zoom in on a little area and look at it. And again, it gives them that experience of actually being at the site. We'll be doing a video recording of it because what we want to do is make the feel people who see this connect with it. So we want, we want them to feel like they're actually going to the side, that, you know, obviously without revealing the location, but we want them to feel like they're there with us and they're part of the, the field team that's sort of going out to um, record it. We'll be recording the landscape biography. Uh, obviously, like I was saying before, these rock uh, sites are part of a larger landscape and that is important, you know, and we need to see them in their contextual framework. So we're recording, recording the landscape biography with the assistance of, of people like me, who is the rock um, conservationist, and he will be coming to look at whether there's lichen going on the surface of the rocks, whether there's any sort of degradation of the surface. And he will work with our students and they'll be recording like, like um, the illustrations we just saw of the, the rock surface to show the vegetation or the, um, the damage to the rock surface. So it'll be very much a collaborative project. Um, again, we'll be doing um, a mapping sort of project to show the <coughs> landscape map and what it looks like around that site because the views were important. You know, it wasn't just looking at the rock, it was also looking out into the, the mountains and over the views. It was also an important part of the site. So we want to record that. Um, and we'll be recording the, um, the ecology around the site. So what plants are going there? Because this is all part of the story. And it's part of the story that I think has been missing. You know, we go to these sites as, as archaeologists or something else, and we just look at the rock. You know, we don't look at the bigger picture of what's around there. So we want to look at the plants and discuss what they might have been used for by the original inhabitants that were there. We'll look at the animals that are there and also discuss whether they were important into the um, original inhabitants as well as totemic animals or as food animals or you know, things like that. All of this is part of the bigger picture that we want to present. We'll be illustrating the process of creation. Obviously that's not in Australia, but if you try to find an image of the making of these things, you, can, you won't find one. And, and that's the sort of thing that we need illustrators to actually put together so people again feel the connection with the original artists. We want to show that these were made by, by people, that you know, it was made by a person sitting, taking a very long time to engrave into that rock or thinking about what to paint on that rock. So we wanted to illustrate that process of creation. And also, we, we want to do more modern, modern historical reconstructions of what they've seen. You know, the only ones that we can ever use are ones by Lysette, but done so long ago. But we want to reconstruct these things in a more modern way. And that might sort of show the, 
um, more spiritual connection or the phenomenological connection with these sites. So with the site of Flat Rock that John was talking about before and the connection with Orion, if we were going to do a scene of that one, we'd, we'd paint it at night and show the sky above it as well as the engraved rocks below it and people sitting there talking about and pointing out things. These are the sort of things you can only do by illustration. Okay, and that's where our sort of strengths come in. And we'll, you know, probably the most important thing that we'll be talking about will be the Aboriginal connection to the land in that area. And, and we're hoping that we'll get students from World War II to sort of come along and, and focus on that area. But we'll, you know, we'll talk about where they might have lived. You know, how a lot of the time that people can actually live where the rock art is. So they'll live, you know, down the valley a little bit more where the food was. Um, you know, so we want to talk about all of those sort of things to put this into a really comprehensive framework for each site. Um, but you know, these, these areas aren't just about the indigenous um, inhabitants. These areas are also have a rich um, settlement history as well. And we want that to be part of the story. We don't just want it to be their history and our history. We want this to be our together, a merged history. Um, so we want to show the history of the white settlement in the area and the farmers coming in and, and you know, all the convicts or something like that. It's all part of the bigger picture of you know, what we need to discuss. We'll um, produce interpretive paintings of the site. Sometimes you can't actually take a photograph of these sites clearly because there's trees in the way or you know whatever else. This is a project I have just happened to work on for the National Parks a while ago at um, Peak Hill. They, they brought me in because they couldn't actually photograph the site because there were trees and you couldn't see it and they said, we just need an archival record of this site. <coughs> um, so that's where I sort of came in and this was like an interpretive sort of one. Um, this was another part of the project that I did, and what we will also be doing with ours is when you can't actually get a picture of the whole site because there's things in the way, what we'll be doing is taking lots of pictures, merging them in Photoshop, and then you can see the whole um, decorated surface. And oops, sorry, and then we'll be able to trace the engravings from that. Obviously, we're not allowed to trace the engravings like they used to in the old days. They will sit down and actually um, put a piece of paper over the rock surface and. and um, trace them that way. We don't do that anymore. So this is the way we do it. You know, you do it into Photoshop or something similar and, and trace it digitally. Um, so this is, this, again, the sort of um, the project that I work on, worked on with the National Parks at Peak Hill, is to provide an illustration that's easily reproduced, where you can actually see what you're looking at, but also easily understood by the viewers. Um, so these are the sort of things that we will be doing. I also think it's really important that we engage with children. Um, I think the children are the future of conservation of these sites. And if we completely forget about them, we're pretty much lost the battle. We do need to engage children in this story. And I think as part of the bigger project that we're putting together, we need to actually address children and to make it interactive with them. So we'll be doing things like this. Don't take too much notice of that picture. It's just want to put together really quickly. But things like you know the hidden um, images, so they will look at that and have to try and find where a lot of emeralds are hiding in the site. Or we'll have another one which has actually got all the motives with a few extra things that are thrown in, just for them to interact with it and feel that connection, you know, with these sites. So the outcomes of this project that um, will be um, we're having the pilot project at the start at the end of June um, is that we hope to gather data um, and the the. We want to do all of the rock art sites in this area. And I, I, part of the thing that I'm doing now is just having to find out about more of the ones that we can actually visit. Um, but we want to use the student projects and the illustrations and make infographics. And these will form the larger um, foundation of the larger projects. So the larger project is an interactive website of all of the rock art sites of the Hunter and surrounding areas. So people can look at the website, click on the site, and find everything they want to know about that site. We want to make it into museum displays. Um, we recently had a museum display up at Newcastle Museum, and the amount of people that go through that museum is amazing. How many people went through it? Uh, 33,000 33, people saw the display we had up in that museum um, last year. So we're, we're missing these opportunities if we're not getting into these places. So we want to have a museum display up there and choose to share the cultural heritage of this area. Um, we want to actually make educational packs beautifully illustrated edu educational packs. I mean, some of the ones that you get out there at the moment, they, they, they could do with more work. Um, so, you know, we want to actually get into the schools and teach the students about these sites so they do form that connection. So if they're out riding their BMX bike out in the bush and they stumble across something, it wouldn't cross their mind to damage it. They would sit there, they'd look at it, 
tell mum and dad, whatever else, but they're not going to damage it because they feel that connection, which is what we are aiming for. And we also want to publish it, but not just in journal articles, we want to publish it in ways that the general public can access it. Um, and, you know, I, I say all these, but I mean in conjunction with people like Robert Tuka and in conjunction with the, um, you know, the Water Rural Group, and those sort of people, it, it's wanted to be a joint thing, not just about us doing it. So the basic aim of our project is um, we, we hope to record these sites in a comprehensive and non-intrusive manner. Um, we hope to provide the sites with a firm contextual framework presented in a visual manner, because that's our strength, so we have to work with what we have. We have to work in close collaboration with Aboriginal group landholders, National Parks, Model Services and OEH, and um, people like um, you know, the, the Coal River Working Party and you know, any sort of interest group, we're, we're happy to work with them. Um, we intend to um, withhold the location of these sites unless they are um, already open to the public. Any students involved in the project will be signing uh, indemnity form at the beginning of the project to say that they will not reveal the location of the sites. And this is important to us, unless they're already publicly known. You know, if, they, if everybody already knows about the Amy sites, obviously they won't have to sign the form for that one. But if you go to more secret locations, that will be kept secret. Um, we hope that people who see the museum displays, website and educational packs will feel a connection to the sites and feel like they have visited them themselves without actually having set foot on the site and damaging them. Um, we hope to build, rebuild that connection um, to the, this um, heritage um, and ultimately conserve these sites. Um, we hope that by visualising, contextualising and sharing these rock art sites with the public in an interactive manner, we might be able to promote a sense of connection between the original artists and the modern viewers, the Indigenous community and the non-Indigenous community. Um, ultimately, this connection might affect damage to the sites and aid in their conservation. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for our portion on our way to have Julian and Bernadette together, right? A pair of talks together. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. That's great. And I mean, it wasn't so long ago, you were talking about conservation and defending values. I can remember when the natural history illustration was going to defend itself. And we still are. I would like to comment something uh, when I were. You go ahead. The work that Bernadette is developing is a good sign of uh, good things come to go to wait. The first time that we were speaking about this project, uh, it was just a hopeless afternoon after our, a request for archaeology program was knocked back just by, no, just like this, even no consideration. Okay? And every single bit of this got together through eight, eight years, something yeah. like that. Okay. And we were lucky, I mean, in, in the last part of it, which we shared the news, um, we were looking for uh, using some drones. And everywhere we went, every, oh, it's too expensive, oh, who cares? So this is another sign of good things comes to uh, those who wait. Some place somewhere in the university had the money and got a drone. And they come to Johnny the other, they said, don't you have a project? Is it? Yeah, yeah, it's been a while that we had, we were seeking for that. So my point here is that as a heritage practitioner and advocate, the key point is to be patient and not not step back when you, when they want you to step back. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Amelia. Well said. Thanks, Julia. Um, I, I found it really interesting, especially given that you are such a fabulous illustrator, that when you were talking about teaching recording of sites to the students, you didn't specifically mention getting them to sketch the art, because that's one thing that we still teach rock art scholars in, in undergraduate courses. We teach archaeologists mm -hmm. that when you're doing all of the, and we do all of those other you know, fancy things, but, and this is coming from someone that's you know, quite heavily into big machine science, mm. 
you, unless you spend the time and you sit with the with the panel and you draw it, you come to a completely different understanding. And you, even when you go back to process those other images and stuff, it's amazing if you if you don't have that time with the panel and you don't sketch it out first and really interact with it, you get very different end results. Absolutely. And sorry if I did skip over that bit. That's not the other. No, well, I was really excited. I thought, gosh, I mean, I've seen what archaeologists can do when they draw yeah. panels. Imagine when you guys get a hold of them. Yeah. Well, I guess it's taken for granted. Yeah, that's what we do. Um, and it's very much what we do. And as far as my PhD project is concerned, that's exactly what I did. I spent so much time reconstructing the frescoes that I saw things that the archaeologists had been missing for 40 years and it was just from that time spent drawing them and reconstructing them and it's very much what we'll be doing. Um, each student will be allocated a project so one student will have to be their project. They will be drawing, they will be looking at what's there, they'll be looking at what's overlaid on top of something else. That will definitely be a part, big part of this. Yeah. Well that, um, you showed uh, Eagles Reach which was one of the sites that takes on yeah. and all those guys um, recorded in Wollamine in the 90s. I was actually on that expedition that went back to re-record that site. I was very fortunate. Yeah. During my undergrad years, um, I was actually involved in that project and I spent four days sketching that, those particular panels and it was amazing each day just how much it's like you had you know, fresh eyes every yeah. time you looked up from your sketch pad. Exactly. And it's that post observation. Yeah. That's so important. And that's something, um, you know, I don't want it to sound like a promo for natural history expression, but that's a big part of what no, we do. No, uh, the yeah. thing I'm really interested in is, is just that difference that an actual, a trained illustrator, what you'll be able to do with yeah. those sketches as opposed yeah. to an archaeologist, you know. Um, so yeah, I work with Bernadette in the Natural History Program. So Natural History uh, has uh, field work is one of the major sub or core subjects taught from 1000 through 3000 level. So um, I guess field work in terms of observational sketching, um, colour notation, all those things done with tradition where you're on site um, is, is in sort of a grain and part of the training environment. I guess this is looking at that complementary set of observations that can be made and then the two sitting together and going, what else can we add? Um, especially when you look at the interactive sort of application so if you can record a particular asset that can be turned around and then put in context and an on an observed um, environment and draw and then sort of you've got a greater range of resources to tell the story so I guess the the drawing side is fundamental to what we do and the technology side is a way how can we evolve that understanding and, and the two forms of observation to say something more that's I guess that's the objective in taking the technology and the drawing part. and it is something that's unique to this university and this is only to be involved that teaches this and I was, when I was at that conference in Vienna a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a rock art specialist there from South Africa, and he was so excited about this project. And I mean, he's worked on rock art projects all around the world. Yeah. But he was so excited about this because it was different, um, and because we were trying to contextualise the sites, and we were presenting them, presenting them in a visual way that could be shared. And he was so excited about that. And I think, you know, it is something that is, has been lacking mm. up until this point. Um, so I just hope that we can use that skill um, to actually do something different. Mm. <laughs> um, I think that conservation and, and protection of these sites is, is paramount, yeah. and therefore, I mean, I, I agree that it's, it's the right thing to do not to let the general public know where the sites are. At the same time, I think it's sad that um, people like me who would respect the sites cannot go there to, to see. So I'm not disagreeing, but it's... Oh, no, I agree totally. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel sad that, you know, um, people can't get the sites because, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, um, I, in the ideal world, it would be great if people could sort of go there. But unfortunately, through the actions of some, you know, it's a ruin for everyone else. Um, and plus, you know, there's also the the non-deliberate damage as well, you know, just, you know, by going there and that stirring up dust and all that sort of stuff can damage them, even if we do go there with good intentions, you know, just by walking over the rock surface with, you know, rock. it's not ideal, um, but it's something that we can do, um, you know, ideally we would be great if we could go there. Just quickly, do you think Australia will ever get to the point, um, like the Lasco caves in France, where they've actually created mm -hmm. the an actual mimic of the Duke. Yeah, I think so. Um, but I, I don't think it will be done in exactly the same way. I think it will be done in a more virtual way that we've sort of just been mm -hmm. probably hear about after lunch. Um, and again, it's a, I think those people who went to Lasco before were sort of close to the public and the, the lucky ones. Um, yeah, I think it's not the same experience as going to the original caves, but it, it is, it, we have to do something. So yeah, I think we will sort of go into that more sort of virtual sort of um, experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah.
I, I think the project is very interesting and uh, it's very an uh, educative event. So for covering the many, uh, you know, collecting the papers and all the things is quite interesting. Things. I, I just have the uh, two uh, very little questions. Maybe I am uh, wrong because I couldn't talk the one. Uh, it's, it's all about to engaging people, right? Uh, so instead of you know the course participant, how do you, what is the plan to you know to engage the others, as you say, the children or other people to engage and they go take photographs or or the videos and put inside. How do you? Uh, what is the you know plan to engage the people, those people? And my second question is, like, you have a, uh, a particular time frame maybe for the project? Yes, so when the project ends, the interactive uh, websites, we have all the resources, all the things, and who is to, going to take care of the project? You know, this is a big challenge, you know, after the finish the project, they're to running the cost, at least the cost, you know, and the maintenance of the server and everything. So well, that's a, a really good point. Um, and and I've, I've seen projects that have done that. And they, when they've collapsed, all of that knowledge was lost. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I definitely don't want it to go down that way, which is why we're hoping to publish each time we go out there and, and make it into books and museum displays and stuff like that. And certainly, um, at the moment, I'm, I'm running the project, but if for some reason I'm not, um, I will pass all of the information on to Johnny um, and the cultural collection so that it would be uh, conserved in some way. Um, you know, I'll hope that somebody else will take it on. At the moment, it's, it's not a limited project. We don't have a time frame as far as, you know, we'll only do this for the next five years because we have no funding. Um, you know, so it is, um, this year we will run it over June and July as a compressed course. And we're hoping to do that every year um, until, you know, whatever happens. Um, we are hoping that we will get funding so we can do it on a more regular basis. So we don't, not just recording one rock art per year. Um, outside, you know, otherwise it's going to take us 3,000 years to get through this. Um, so, you know. Just uh, one, yeah. one more question. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, one of the questions I had is, um, do you find the part of the reason for, like, that people are, I guess, for the, for the deterioration of rock art? I guess this question goes to both, you, both of you. Um, do you. Do you feel that part of that is the lack of connection that people have um, to rock art and uh, Aboriginal heritage and Absolutely. things like that. Yeah, yeah, and that's what they're trying to address through, through doing this. It is that lack of connection. I mean, people would never think of analyzing something that they feel a connection to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what has to be addressed. I, that lack of connection. I lived, uh, I lived for two and a half years in a uh, little country in Europe, Montenegro, and there they had a Turkish. Uh, many years under the, under Turkish rule and I see I saw over there just complete degradation and disregard for anything that was Turkish or even Greek um, because it wasn't their history and you know if it, I, I was wondering if that's that's the same problem yeah I think that is what has happened in this country um, and you know slowly um, we've been bringing this into the education system and stuff like that we're starting to see a change and we're starting to see a bit more respect from the, the children and the youngest sort of adults and, and, and all the people as well but um, it was sort of like I mentioned in the, when I first started the presentation about what, what I saw happening in Jordan mm -hmm. and it was the same thing there you know they had just lost that connection with the early part of their heritage um, and you know they were vandalizing you know, anything that wasn't Anything pre that happens before. Um, and, yeah. Thank you. Did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I think, it, I think very similarly, it, it goes to a, a broader lack of connection and respect with um, Indigenous culture and with Indigenous Australians. I mean, I've literally had people at dinner parties in Newcastle say to me, um, but you work in Aboriginal heritage, what do you do in Australia? Like they, they, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Oh. And someone else sitting at the table will be of a wonderful descent. Mm. And you just, it, it's just, and it's not, um, you know, it's ignorance. It's not, it's not necessarily persecution or you know any of that stuff or disempowerment. It is just simply ignorance. And I think a lot of it does go back to what we're teaching in our schools. We don't, you know, we don't have a pride for our indigenous heritage the way that we should. Can we make them very quick because yeah. we've got tendons over time? I've mentioned this before, but when I was growing up, and I'm nearly 70 now, um, a song, we learned a song, and it used to be sung to us, Go to sleep, my little piccaninny, the bogeyman will catch you if you don't. The bogeyman was always black, and I think I grew up having a fear. Not that there were many Aboriginals in Maitland, <coughs> but I had a fear of black people. 
Let's have a change to the For somebody who has no technological capacity and even less artistic capacity, um, is there a possibility that someone like me might be able to participate in this project? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and that's, anyone who has the capacity to research can be a part of this project. So, you know, if you could look at, you know, the, the, um, the Aboriginal connection to the land or the white settlers in that area or something like that, um, if you have the capacity to research, we can find a problem. That I can do. Thank you very also, sorry if sure I can just very, very, very quickly. Um, a lot of these technologies as well, uh, things like de-stretch, that's available as an app, right? So these are things that you can use. These are these are becoming very accessible technologies. A lot of the 3D software, so I mean, you can download this stuff and it's everywhere. Fantastic. So, Johnny, you've got a lot of information to bring together coming out of all this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Johnny. The birds are arriving now. So. <laughs>